press the record button for now. And let everyone in. There we go. You don't know the count of what 75 one, what I do, that's all over here. Okay. Okay. Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Islamic Courses Zoom session titled Book Review Discussion India in the Persianite Age, 1000 to 1765. Honored and very privileged to have uh, the author, Professor Richard Eaton from the University of Arizona, US of A. And it's hosted by, by a dear friend, starred Professor Jonathan Brown from Georgetown University uh, as well from the USA. Just a quick reminder before I hand it over to uh, Professor Jonathan, who's going to introduce the speaker and the subject. Uh, please keep your phones or devices on mute. It is being recorded. Um, so if you're not already on our mailing list uh, or registered, please leave your uh, email on the chat and we'll send you a link once it's uploaded. And there is a Q&A session. So what's gonna happen, uh, Dr. Jonathan is going to be engaging and talking with the professor and Professor Richard Eaton for the next 40 minutes or so. And after that, we'll have around another half an hour for Q&A with the public. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Professor Jonathan. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, well, Assalamu alaikum everybody. Um, this is a real treat for me, um, so I'm not going to waste any time. Uh, this this bio is it's sort of it's like saying Madonna is a musician or something. This is the sh a short bio. <laughs> it could really should be a lot longer. Uh, Richard Eaton is a professor of history at the University of Arizona. I'm reading from the the bio from the sleeve of his book, and the author of several groundbreaking books on India before 1800, including the classic The Rise of Islam on the Bengal Frontier. Uh, so I'll just say that um, Professor Eaton is known for, I mean, he's published so much, uh, so many books, so many articles. Um, he really, what, maybe the leading scholar of of kind of India in the Persianate age, um, Islam in, in the Islamic age and the Muslim age, however one wants to, to call it. Uh, there's just a couple, these are the books of his that I have, right? So one is this... Um, Essays on Islam in Indian History, uh, which is a collection of his uh, articles and I think book chapters from other earlier books. This is an edited collection that he edited, uh, India's Islamic Traditions, which is a fantastic resource. I've used this all, all, actually a lot. Uh, there's a lot of really valuable material in here. And but his most famous book, I think, uh, is The Rise of Islam on the Bengal Frontier. And um, this book is the one we're going to be discussing today and you know i i gotta say i it's ironic i actually don't like reading very much i which is kind of weird being a professor but i i don't very very rarely very, very read books cover to cover and this book i read cover to cover and i actually enjoyed it i, I don't know if you've all read it but i really recommend it it's um it is a very easy read it's beautifully written it is um detailed without being tiresome it's comprehensive without being overwhelming it's theoretically sophisticated without being kind of arcane and uh overly academic i i really it, it covers almost every aspect of kind of of, of life uh, whether it's politics economics society religion art architecture uh talking about indian history integrating it into global history both in the kind of Indian Ocean world, in the world of Iran and Central Asia, um, by an author whose uh, expertise and language abilities have made him able to access and master sort of all these different uh, factors and dynamics. I, I really can't say enough good stuff about the book. I really, really highly recommend it. Also, it's also got some great pictures in it uh, for those of you who like pictures like me. Um, so actually, w before we were, uh, you all joined, I was uh, talking to Professor Eaton about his, his life experience, which I think is really interesting on, in, um, on its own. Uh, so maybe he can, uh, you can kind of review briefly what you were telling me about how you got interested in the study of Indian history, and also kind of your journey through the different languages and the, the region itself. Yes, yes. Well, First of all, uh, Jonathan, thank you for that very generous 
uh, introduction. It's a, it's a great pleasure to join you and, and to get be back in touch with Islamic circles in London, because I have my own very fond memories of, of about 10 years ago when I, I had the good fortune of uh, spending several days in, uh, on the, on the on east, east side of London with, with you folks. Um, but yes, to your question as to how I kind of got into the whole field, uh, when I graduated from college, I uh, got a telegram from Sergeant Shriver. Uh, and without, before I opened the telegram, I assumed that I had just been drafted into the Vietnam War, since his first name was Sergeant. Uh, but then when I opened up the, the uh, telegram, it, it said that I had been chosen to, uh, to join the first Peace Corps project to Iran. Uh, which was absolutely a no-brainer. For one thing, I had no other uh, alternative after my graduating from college. I had no plan. So this fell into that. Secondly, my parents, my mother and father, were both already in Iran. Uh, my father uh, was, the, uh, was the doctor, the surgeon, the, the chief physician at, at the, uh, the Christian hospital in Meshed. I'd been there already for five years. And my grandmother had been born in Iran since my great-grandfather had come out there in the 19th century uh, as, a, as a Presbyterian missionary in Urumia, in, in Tabriz. And by pure luck or fate or something, uh, the, the Peace Corps sent me back to the same city, Tabriz, about a century after my great-grandfather had lived there. So all of this was kind of destiny. And I spent two years in Iran, uh, learned the language, uh, came to love Iranian culture. And while I was there, uh, I and two other Peace Corps volunteers made the, the fateful decision to uh, visit India and Pakistan. So we hitchhiked. Well, we didn't hitchhike. Uh, at that point, we were taking trains and buses through uh, Iran. Uh, and down through Pakistan and then through virtually all of India, or at least a lot of India, as far south as Madras and as far east as Calcutta. And then we came back to Afghanistan. At that point, I hitchhiked through Afghanistan, came back about a, through a, after a month of this traveling. And for me, this was, had a huge impact because when I visited India, I saw all this evidence of Persian culture and Islamic culture which I was not prepared for. Nobody told me that there were Muslims in India. I only subsequently learned that India, in fact, has more, a larger Muslim population than the entire Middle East. And so, so I go to, I see this architecture, I, I hear the music, I, I, I see the, the cuisine, the food, all this evidence of, of, uh, of Iranian culture in India, and I was immediately hooked on it. And I, and I wanted to understand more. You know, how did this come about? How, how do we understand the relationship between Persian and Indian cultures, between Sanskrit and Persian, between Hinduism and Islam? And how do we explain the, the differential influences and the, the different impacts that, uh, that Iran and Persian and Islam had? Because it's not even throughout South Asia. You know, in, in some parts there's greater influence, in other parts there's less influence. How do we explain that? So this has kind of became my lifelong obsession, if you will. And that's how I began my work on, um, on working on Islam in South Asia. But this book that you're introducing today, Jack, really represents the culmination of, my, of an earlier fixation with Persian language and Persian culture, which I see as an alternative way of understanding Indian history. And maybe we could talk about that more later on. But, but basically, to give you a sense of my own background, uh, that's how it began. I, I became interested in, 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 largely I became interested in conversion to Islam to understand how do, we, how do we explain the extraordinarily large populations and large Muslim communities and societies in South Asia. And my first book, The Sufis of Bijapur, was really an attempt to explain that. Why? Because what I announced that I wanted to understand conversion, 
everybody told me that, well, in that case, you have to study Sufis, because that's what Sufis do. So I said, okay, I'll study Sufis. So I, I went out and did this year-long research uh, of the Sufis in one part of, the, of India, namely the, the Deccan Plateau, only to find that the Sufis were not remotely interested in converting anyone to Islam, completely overthrew all the assumptions that I had held. It completely uh, uh, refuted the one thing that perhaps both Indians and Pakistanis agree on, which is that Islam grew because of Sufism. And it's my sad news to report that that probably is not true. That the one thing they agree, agree on is not the case. So I did a study of the, the social roles of, of Sufis to find out what they were doing. If, if they were not running around converting Hindus to Islam, what were they really doing? And that launched me into the, that kind of social study of, of, of Sufism. But I never left my original aim of, of understanding Islamization. But that's the reason I went to study Bengal, because I, I decided that if I really want to take seriously this question of Islamization, then I have to go to Bengal, study Bangla language, and immerse myself in that culture to try to figure that out. So basically, that in a nutshell, Jack, is, is kind of how I got into this larger question. Wow. Um, so Again, by the way, people, if you ha didn't hear me before, I, I really encourage you. Again, I do not read books cover to cover. Almost never do that. I hate reading. I really enjoyed reading this book. I, I really enjoyed almost every page. Uh, so I cannot recommend it enough to you. Um, so one of the things that uh, I remember the, the, the Greek historian Polybius, you know, second century BC, writes history of Rome. And he says that like the three things historians need to do they need to be able to praise their enemies and criticize their friends they need to know sort of historical sources and they said they need to know the actual places that the events occurred and one of the things that i really liked about this book is um you really seamlessly weave into the book a uh your understanding of the landscape the geography the topography um and i think that's that's so you i it's, i think that's one, pretty rare, and two, extremely useful in general, I think probably more so than normal in study of Indian history, uh, you know, to explain why, you know, what is it about the Deccan, you know, there's the, I think, Vindhya Mountains, those are these low hills, mountains, like what, what is it that, you know, when people said Hind in 1300, they didn't mean India, right? They meant essentially the kind of Gangetic plain. Um, uh, what is it about uh, Gujarat? You know, what is Gujarat as a as a what makes it a unit? Um, Malabar. Why is Malabar connected to the Indian Ocean and kind of not really connected to the actual Deccan um, as much? And so, one, uh, what I one thing I, I really wanted to hear maybe from your own experience is in your travels, whether it was those original travels or later research trips. Uh, were there, do you remember any times when you kind of saw a place or a region or you were driving or taking a train somewhere and you noticed something about the geography and the topography that, that kind of unlocked some understanding for you about a history that you had previously maybe not had as, had not been able to figure out? Oh, I think yes, all the time. Um, I mean, India, South Asia, the, the whole subcontinent, is so extraordinarily diverse in terms of topography and climate zones that you cannot help but try to understand what's the, what is the connection between that and and the historical record. Um, so yes, I mean I I've, I mean I recall, for example, the first time that I descended into the Indus Valley, uh, I came down through the Bolan Pass from Quetta on a train and you're up on the plateau, the Iranian plateau, and we always hear about the Iranian plateau, but when, you, when you've been living on the Iranian plateau for a full year, as I had been, you take it for granted. But then suddenly, when you descend through the Bolan Pass down into the Indus Valley, you are in a completely new world. It's low, it's flat, it's green. 
and that's when we when you I connected that with you know later on I read Babur the Babur Nama when he is for the first time encountering India like me he was coming from the Iranian plateau uh, descending through the Khyber Pass and has the same reaction that is to say he found a world that to him was completely different uh, the the domestic architecture was different the the, the, the crops were different the, the animal the, the wildlife was different. Um, and so I guess to answer your question, to me, the, my initial encounter with South Asia coming from Pakistan, I, I could even say the, a, a train from Pakistan uh, into South Asia, that was a defining moment that when I really suddenly said, wow, this is a different place, totally different place. And, and that's only one such occasion I could cite like that. Um, one thing that, you know, I, I guess is kind of a pet, long time pet question of mine, and it may be a stupid question, so you can either get rid of it quickly or answer it if it's worth it, which is, uh, you know, and you bring this up at a few points in the book about the, especially with Shah Jahan, um, the, the way that the, the Mughals hang on to their kind of nomadic, pastoral nomadic Central Asian kind of horseman past. Um, not just in the kind of sense of Timur and his legacy of sovereignty, but really in the idea of, you know, always having a falcon and this. Uh, and so my, what I was wondering is, was there a, did they kind of consciously preserve a, a sense of like a nomadic roving capital uh, that might that was different from the Indian tradition that was distinct from it? Yes, they did. I mean, um, you know, the, the capital of the Mughal Empire was wherever the emperor happened to be. Uh, and the emperor was, I mean, it's true, Akbar stayed in Lahore for something like eight or nine years. Um, Shah Jahan spent most of his time in, in Agra until he built Shah Jahanabad. Uh, but so there were those capitals, obviously, uh, which follows a very ancient tradition of, of Indian uh, military um, um, statecraft. On the other hand, unlike Indian kings, classical Indian kings who stayed in their their Rajdhani, their capital, uh, the Mughals retained that kind of Central Asian tradition of mobility, uh, of, of, of living in tents. And if you look at the architecture, even when they did settle down and build capital cities like Shah Jahanabad, you look at the Divan Khas or any of these, these structures, they still retain something like a, a tent-like structure almost. You could see the tent pole and the, and the, the, the architecture, the way it's built, uh, has a distant echo of a, of a yurt uh, or something out of Central Asia. So there is this, this, this uh, lingering memory of a Timurid past, which they never let go of. And you're quite right, Shah Jahan is the one who most explicitly reinforces that, not least by attempting to reconquer uh, Badakhshan and, and northern Afghanistan uh, in his, in his uh, rather um, misguided <laughs> assumption that he was the, the second Lord of Conjunction after Timur himself. So yes, I would answer your question by saying that absolutely, there, there, is, that, there, there is that memory and the Mughals acted it out as when, when they were on, uh, traveling. Aurangzeb spent 25 years in the Deccan uh, living like a classic Central Asian uh, badsha, which is to say living in tents and moving around with the army. The, when, when you go to a place like the Agra or um, Shah Jahanabad and you see you know, in the Divan you see in the Divan Echas, like this, the Tacht, right, which is this, it sort of looks like a, like a marble platform or something. Um, was right. that, did they put the, their throne on top of that, the peacock throne or whatever they were sitting on? Or was that, did they just put a bunch of pillows there? Or what was that thing you're actually looking at now when you go and you see these places? Yeah, if you, if you go to the, that's right. If you go to Shah Jahanabad now in, in Old Delhi, uh, in the Red Fort, what you're actually seeing that marble canopy, um, which by the way has 
really traces its architectural roots to Bengal uh, with, a, with a curved cornice, you know, you have there. That was not the throne. That simply held the, the peacock throne. The peacock throne itself, of course, was, was, was taken away by Nader Shah, 1739. Um, there was another kind of a ersatz uh, uh, second throne put in there, but it was not the original peacock throne. Uh, after after another Shah left, after he raided North India, so yeah, the peacock throne itself was taken taken back, and uh, I believe that it was ultimately broken up in Iran. Although I've also heard that parts of it survive in the Banka Meli in Tehran, and I'm not quite certain which is true, whether it still survives in part, or whether it's totally broken up, broken up and. and into jewels. After all, it was nothing but jewels uh, from, from end yeah. to end. Yeah. Um, one thought, I, one thing I, to get back to your, your interest in conversion, which really surprised me, uh, was that in Bengal, and I think you, you, this is under Jahangir, you say he actually kind of dis to punish people who promoted changing any religion, right? So that actually like the, the Mughals were discouraged conversion to Islam in Bengal and, and actually it seems like they didn't want anybody to change any religion. They just sort of wanted, can, can you explain that? I mean, I think that's probably very surprising to anybody. Why, why, what was their reasoning? Um, oh, I don't think it's surprising at all. The Mughals were an empire and in an empire, you need to please everybody you don't want to rock the boat. And if anyone is out there indulging and trying to change people's cultural identity, they are understandably seen as upsetting the kind of stability that the empire requires. In my view, the Mughals really stood for three things, which was revenue, loyalty, and stability. They did not care about religion. Um, and in my analysis of, of the original sources in Bengal, just speaking of, of, of that part of the empire, um, they promoted the building of Hindu temples as much as they did the building of mosques. They didn't care. As long as there was some kind of structure there that would, would, that would provide institutional stability on the frontier, that's what they wanted, the stability. So you're right. Uh, when when uh, the Mughals found that one of their officers had converted somebody to Islam, he was punished. He was taken. He was his jagir assignment was reduced, and that sending a very clear message that the Mughals were not about to tamper with religion. Um, another thing you mentioned, which I was really surprised by in Bengal, is that it's really only in the I, maybe I misunderstand this. It's really only in the 1500s that you start seeing the use of paper in Bengal. And then so like things right. like paper and pen, these words in, in, in um, Indian, not, you know, non-Persian Indian languages are right. uh, actually from Persian and, and Arabic, uh, Qalam and Qaghiz. So what right. was, what were, how, how were people, how were things recorded or written in Bengal prior to the, that time? Well, you had, um, a, a number of things. Uh, you you had uh, uh, these 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 kind of paper-like reeds uh, that that were used to write on, um, and they would be these these long thin reeds would be bound together by a by a by a metal um, uh, a cylinder of some kind or or, or a uh, of, uh, like a keychain, um, they were used, but much more awkward than paper itself. So when paper comes to Bengal or anywhere in India, uh, it very rapidly replaces the existing technology of writing. And because it was so much more easy to use, uh, it rapidly, uh, well, it meant a number of things. For one thing, it enhanced state power because it meant that more orders could be sent out and received between capitals and peripheries. And um, it also meant that 
things like uh, you know the court, judicial decisions could reach further down into local society because of the advent of paper meant that there was a larger bureaucracy, both for revenue bureaucracy and for 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 uh, justice. And uh, so I see the technology of paper as being fundamental in understanding the the diffusion of state power, but also ultimately uh, new religious systems. Obviously, Islam is a religion of the book. Well, you're not going to have the book without paper. And <laughs> so that, that also, I think, uh, supported the diffusion of the Islamic uh, tradition as well. Um, and as you rightly point out, the, the word uh, which is I think ultimately a Turkish word, or it comes from somewhere in Central Asia, into Persian, and kalam, the Arabic word for, for pen. These words are found all over South Asia, whether it's Telugu or Kannada or, or Bengali or Marathi or whatever it might be. Um, indeed, in the 17th century, it's estimated that 40%, as much as 40% of the vocabulary of Marathi was in fact Persian which gives you some idea of the extraordinary influence of the whole uh, Persian um, cultural tradition that, that kind of sweeps over South Asia. And that in turn is what really made me think about using the language uh, as a, a, a central organizing feature of the, of the book. Um, on the other, I mean, the, the, the kind of, I guess the tension or the, the dynamic in the book is really this interaction between the sort of Persianate world, Persianate idiom, language, literature, culture, and yeah. then the sort of Sanskrit world. And so they kind of blend, they, they affect, they, they bleed into one another, they shape one another, they intermingle. Um, and one of the things I thought was really interesting is you, you talk about the kind of, um, the, the sort of Indianization or the Sanskritization or the Rajputization of these Muslim courtly, these Muslim states and Muslim political culture as it through the, really from like 1300 until, you know, 1700s, right? right. Uh, and one thought thing I was really fascinating was this notion of the Raj, Rajputization, uh, right. which you describe, I think, really well. Uh, and and that it goes back so early. And one thing I, which is really interesting to me, is the idea that Rajput. If you go back to like 1300, Rajput isn't a ethnicity or a group of people who live in Rajasthan, right? It's a. It's al almost made me think of samurai. This idea of sort of a martial retainer uh, who could be anywhere, right? This sort of certain martial ethos and a notion of being a warrior for a certain lord. And then right. as you get into the 1500s, that really kind of focuses in on. A group, a certain group of families and clans that living in a certain area in these forts of Rajasthan, right? And then that becomes fixed there. But one of the things that was fascinating is the that you have these figures, even in the sort of time of the Delhi Sultanate, who are um, Muslims who have completely absorbed this Rajput martial ethos to the point that they do the Jauhar thing, where they, um, whether it's in one guy you talk about, I think is in Rajasthan and and Ranthambone. And the other guy is in Bengal, right? And they're they're getting attacked, and so they they put their whole families to death, and then they go out and like these suicide right. missions, basically. And they're Muslims, which I thought was so interesting. Um, and maybe you could just go into more of like this, and how how much the Rajput ethos ends up shaping the right. Mughal uh, political culture. Well, that's a very good point, and it is a very fascinating one because it shows the degree to which by the by the 16th and 17th century. You know, I mean, Muslims now have already been in South Asia for, for half a millennium. And by this time, uh, they are assimilating at an extraordinary rate into, into dominant modes of, of, uh, of culture. And since the Rajputs were kind of the martial class of North India into which the Turks were insinuating themselves, it was perhaps inevitable that there would be a lot of cross fertilization between the two. And yes, you're right. The tradition of Johar, uh, the destruction of women, <clears throat> uh, when you know that you're doomed, uh, this was happening. We, we begin to see Muslims doing this in Bengal uh, on, on several occasions. 
Um, another example of that, of course, is the is the uh, the Jataka uh, Darshan. The Jataka Darshan is this tradition of having a, a, a special balcony, which is built on the exterior of the facade of a palace where the ruler would present himself for, for, for darshan, for viewing by the subjects. Well, this was an ancient tradition uh, among North Indian kings. Uh, Rajputs were not the only ones who did this, uh, but it was a, a style that was picked up probably as early as Humayun. Uh, everyone says it begins with Akbar, but I think there, it, the idea really is, it, it really goes back to Huma, his father. Uh, Humayun, who who uh, begins to this tradition of of you know greeting the sun while the subjects are greeting you, and there is this, and which is of course a purely North Indian style of of of, of kingship, and so the Rajput tradition uh, certainly lives on, and perhaps most importantly. Uh, Akbar's assimilation of Rajput women into his harem meant that the particular dialect of, of Northeastern Rajasthan, uh, Braj, uh, now enters the, the, the Mughal harem and the next generation of, of Mughal rulers are the, the sons of Rajput women, meaning that they have learned Hindavi language as their mother language, literally their mother language. And we all know that mothers have more influence on children than fathers ever do. That's probably every, anywhere in the world. So if we look at language, if we look at styles of, of political presentation, the, the, the Jharaka I just mentioned, if we look at the Johar tradition, all these are Rajput um, ideas and, and cultural norms which become readily assimilated by the Mughals. So it's really almost fair to say that the Mughals are, in many sense, really a Rajput dynasty. Uh, when, by the time you get to Shah Jahan, the Mughals have more Rajput blood, just in terms of, of, of how many Rajput women had, had, had been there. You know, the, the Turkish or Central Asian uh, proportion of their ethnicity, their, physically speaking, gets progressively diminished as you move from the early 16th century from Babur himself uh, down to the time of Shah Jahan. Yeah, you mentioned how Shah Jahan was uh, three quarters Rajput. That's right. Right. Um, so w one question I've always had, and it's been hard to find an answer. I, so when, when well, let's put it this way. So when Babur comes into India, what language would he be yelling at his kids in? And Turkic. then, okay, uh, so Turkic. Okay, then, um, at what point do you think that they start yelling at their kids in North Indian language, Hindavi, with, well, uh, with ba Akbar? Definitely with Akbar, because by the time you come to Akbar, again, it's because of the, the rapprochement between the Mughals and the Rajputs that these Indian women come into the harem and their sons have every much legitimacy as do the sons of, of Central Asian women. And so it means that really from his period on uh, is when you, when you see this, this uh, trend coming in. Linguistically, uh, there's no doubt that Turkish was the, as you put it, the, the, the language you, you speak to your children or the dinner table the, you know, at home. Uh, certainly going all the way back to the Ghazavids, the Gurids, the Mamluks, uh, the Khiljis, and the Tughluks. Uh, they were all Turkish speaking um, as their first language. The Lodis would have been Afghan, they were speaking Pashti. But then when you're with Babu, you're back with Turkish, probably Humayun as well. But beginning with Akbar, uh, you are seeing, you know, like, the, the, the Babur Nama gets translated from Turkish into Persian. Uh, and with Akbar, it's really Hindavi, not Turkish, that is the spoken language at home. Um, of course, Persian is patronized by all of them, uh, every, all of these dynasties. But yeah, Hindavi comes into the court 
as the as a as a as a dominant language, as an important language, uh, beginning with Akbar, and then really reaches its height under Aurangzeb. So one thing, which uh, I mean, we this notion of Hindavi, right? Um, I, you know, one often hears that sort of Hinduism as a religion is sort of a creation or category created by British, you know, um, colonial uh, scholars. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not a specialist in this, so I, I just read this numerous times. But what I thought was interesting was that you talk about how Shivaji, the sort of this kind of founding Marathi leader in the 1600s, he he fashions himself as a protector of the Hindu faith, uh, which I'm going to butcher, Hendavi Dharma Darakla. Right. Um, so what was he, when he says, I'm a protector of the Hindu faith, what is he actually, I mean, is he saying there's a thing called Hinduism, I'm the protector of this thing, or what is he uh, referring to? Would, would everybody have understood what he meant? That's a fascinating question. Uh, needless to say, Shivaji is one of these lightning rods in Indian history uh, because of the the widespread belief that his whole mission was one of of uh, protecting, preserving, if not restoring, uh, the whole idea of Hindu kingship. And it is true that he self-consciously was doing precisely that. Uh, he famously brings in uh, a Brahmin all the way from Banaras. Uh, down to Maharashtra in order to officiate at his own coronation. Why? Because he needs to be publicly seen not as a, um, a, a coming from a, a, a somewhat middling or lower uh, caste in the Maratha uh, society, but rather as a Kshatriya, as a warrior. And it was his desire to present himself as a Kshatriya and, and, and have this Brahmin uh, coming all the way from Banaras down to officiate. Uh, that is what I think led him to go the whole distance and uh, see himself as therefore preserving not only uh, an upper caste Kshatriya persona, but also a specifically Hindu one. Uh, and I, I think that's really what he was all about. He needed to justify his uh, his his uh, seizure of power, which is not unusual. This happens all the time in Indian history. People need to find some means of, of justifying their grabbing power. And Shivaji was an extraordinarily successful um, uh, warlord who was able to parlay his victories into uh, one of kingship, which was then retroactively justified through this idea of his being a kshatriya and also through the idea of his now being one who's defending Hindu dharma or, or the, the, the Hindu religion. Um, I'll just ask one more question. I think probably then uh, hand it over to other people who have questions, uh, if that's yeah. okay with you, Mizan. Um, one thing that you bring up several times in the book, I, which I, you know, is it comes up a lot of the flow of money. And I thought this was, you know, you, you, you talk about the transition, there's sort of a transition from these, the sort of Ghaznavids um, and the early Ghurids as like these raiders are basically coming in and raiding and then going back into Central Asia, really they're, um, to once you get to the Ghurid and the founding of the Delhi Sultanate, that now uh, precious metals and treasures are no longer being kind of taken out of India, they're staying there. But then there's the, you get further at, expansion or raiding into the south into the Deccan which is not done out of some kind of bloodlust or something but because the main concern of the uh, some the Khaljis and uh, uh, Shah Balan and people like that is actually defending against these constant Mongol attempts to invade right so they they're basically raiding to the south to get money to pay for more horses and more troops to defend against the Mongols are coming from the north right. uh, and then uh, you, you talk about the the wealth of textiles, whether it's the Deccan, whether it's Bengal, and that it's this textile trade that really starts to integrate, um, that really integrates India into a world economic, kind of Indian economic zone. And then as you get into the 1600s, 1700s, into a global economic 
trade right. with Europe. So, I mean, uh, how, I, I guess maybe is, is if you were to talk about this as a book about textile, what would you, how would you, what would you say? Well, I think you're right. Textiles are really the, I, I think, lie at the base of understanding um, India's relations, economic relations with the rest of the world. I mean, India had been exporting textiles for long before the, uh, the, the Turks reached North India. Uh, I mean, we know that there is a long historical kind of trajectory of India's need for silver because India does not have uh, much in the way of its own silver mines or even or gold mines. So to, in order to obtain silver and gold, it has always been historically necessary for India to export the one thing they do have, uh, which, which is lots of cotton and, and silk, especially cotton textiles. So here's, as you rightly point out, Gujarat, uh, but also Coromandel and Bengal uh, become major centers of textile production throughout the whole period of, of my book. But, but that doesn't start with my book. Uh, that had already been a well-established pattern uh, that long preceded the, the, the arrival of the, uh, the Gossamans and, and the, uh, the Gorids. Um, and of course, the, it's the 18th century that we normally think of as the, as the, as the moment when, when India suddenly breaks open in the, in the world scene, obviously, because that's why the British East India Company went there, was to find the origin of of, of, these, of these very finely woven muslin uh, cotton goods, which were especially prevalent in Bengal, which is why Calcutta became uh, the center of the company's operations. But that is really reading history backwards. Uh, the reality is that, you know, we can find, we have material evidence of Gujarati cotton goods being exported to Egypt uh, as, as early as the eighth and ninth century because the fabric itself has survived in the, in the dry climate of, of, of Egypt. Um, and you, so if you go to the textile museum in Ahmedabad, for example, in Gujarat, uh, you'll see these kinds of things, or even the textile museum in, in, in Washington, DC, um, as I remember it, has a few remnants of that same fabric. So we have the physical evidence of India's export of textiles uh, going very far back in time. This was the engine that drove India's long-term uh, connected, connectedness, connection with the rest of the world. Because they needed horses and they needed silver. And these items were, were bartered largely through the export of, of textiles, but obviously at spices and, and, and many other things as well. But yes, I would agree with that. Textiles are really are at, at, lie at the base of the whole, the whole story. And you look at how many words in English language today come from uh, textiles like calico, sash, um, you know, uh, cumberbund, sirsucker, yeah, shirochakar in Persian, milk and sugar. They're, they're all over the place. And that draws attention not only to India's uh, extraordinary integration with the rest of the world in terms of its exporting of textiles, but it also points to the influence of Persian on India, once again, which I always go back to that, which is after all the, the title of the book, um, India and the Persian Age, because many of these words for textiles were themselves ultimately Persian words, like khaki, uh, like, like the yeah, seersucker. Um, bandana. Bandana, tafta, and, and so many others. So it's the, and I just want to kind of say one last thing, Jack, uh, and that is that the reason that I really wrote this book was because I was dissatisfied with the traditional way in which this long period of India's history has been presented, which is to say, as one long story of Hindu-Muslim uh, interaction, if not conflict. Um, I came to see that as, to a great extent, a matter of reading history backwards, starting with the partition of 1947, and then reading all of previous history in terms of, of culminating in that, uh, as if all history was simply a prologue to the partition. And 
I also have to say that I, I saw so much evidence that contradicted the idea of, of perpetual Hindu-Muslim uh, conflict uh, without denying that there was, of course, Hindu-Muslim alterity and identity, obviously, there was lots of that. Um, but I, I needed to find some alternative model or, or a way in which to uh, grasp this thousand year period of history. And to go back very briefly to my, to my own biography and how this happened, you know, Penguin commissioned me that they wanted me to write this book uh, as, a, as a textbook. And so I, when I almost finished the book, I was at a dinner party here in Tucson and a colleague of mine, actually the wife of a colleague of mine, who knew nothing about Indian history, asked me a very innocent question after dinner. She said, Dick, what is the argument of your book? And I kind of stared out the window for a minute. I didn't have any answer because I didn't imagine that my book had an argument. I didn't think that textbooks were supposed to have arguments in the way that monographs always do. But I slept on it and by the next morning, I woke up with the idea that yes, there is an argument and I need to make that argument. And the argument is that the, that the traditional kind of way, the, the threadbare way of looking at Indian history through the prism of religion is to some extent a red herring, to some extent uh, a, a rabbit hole that we've all gone down perhaps too far. And, um, and, I, and I, I thought there needed to be an answer to this. I've, I've been dismayed at the way in which, uh, especially in the age of Modi, um, the, there's been this polarization of, of, of medieval Indian history, uh, which he himself, I have to say, dismisses as, as 1,200 years of slavery. Now, that's his rhetoric. And when I hear words like that, I'm thinking this whole thing needs to be rethought. And when I discovered Shelley Pollock's book on Sanskrit and his thesis of the Sanskrit cosmopolis, a light bulb went off in me and I suddenly realized that this is, this could be the answer. This could be the argument that my, the hostess at this dinner party was asking for, namely, that there actually was a Persian cosmopolis, although I don't use that word in the book. I think it's too jargon. You need to use a, a, a more user-friendly word. But if anything, the Persian cosmopolis was more cosmopolitan than Shelley Pollock's understanding of a Sanskrit cosmopolis. And so I went with that. And that's kind of the way, that's the backstory of how I, the reason I wrote Yeah, I, I think one of the, you know, to your point, one of the, the, the sort of ironies um, that comes out, of, and you say this very clearly in the book, which is that, you know, Persian was a really good cosmopolitan language and idiom because yeah. it actually wasn't attached to a religion, right? So you have Arabic is attached to Islam, uh, right. Sanskrit is attached to sort of Hindu Brahmin tradition, but Persian was this language that sort of everybody could use administratively or historically or in poetry or referring to Saadis, Gulistan or something, because it was all it was right. a very uh, it was a shared pool, kind of a value-free pool um, of, of of language and ideas and references. So it's sort of ironic that um, that the so I guess starting with the British, as you describe it, this kind of the, the Indian Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, the Muslim Ages, right? They all the British sort of all lump that in together, is um, is kind of categorized as Mohammedan or Islamic when. Um, one really could think about it as like a, a a time when you have the most ecumenical idiom of communication. Uh, yes, that's so, right. Uh, um, I, 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 I see there's a, there's a lot of people here. I know if, if, if they have questions or not. Um, Mizan, how do you want me to do this? You just want me to people to pipe up or raise their hand or how should this work? Or should they write things in the chat? Jack, just continue. Um, we still got we still got about half an hour, so we've got about another ten more minutes we can take between yourself and the professor, and then we'll open up for questions from the. Because I've the seen conference. some names in this. Uh, I see some names on there. I recognize these are not stupid people. They have to have questions. <laughs> it's your shout, Jack. You know? It's it's absolutely. No, I mean I know some of them maybe. Uh, 
people who might complain about not being called on or something. There's a chance Fair to have enough. your voice heard, folks. There's a chance to have your voice heard. You've got <laughs> Richard Eaton here. He's on the phone. He's sitting there. Okay, so Bismillah. Okay, let's just start with the uh, questions. Apologize for the background noise. I mean, uh, I mean, I can ask him questions for yeah. like as I can ask questions yeah. for as long as I feel like I have tons of questions. But I, you know, you people, there's 66 of you. I know some of you out there. Okay, so uh, yeah, so Jack, there's some questions on the um, uh, on the chat. So you choose which ones you want to um, uh, uh, you want to get answered. It's up to you. Uh, and if there's anyone who wants to ask questions directly on the Zoom. Please raise your hands on the uh, Zoom oh. icon, which is to well, raise. I don't your see hands. that. Where where in the chat are the questions? I don't see any. I don't see any questions in the chat. Am I looking at the wrong wrong place or something? Yeah, you you have to push the chat button. Yeah, I have a bit. Okay, well, anyway, if you see them, then you can answer them directly because I don't see any. I just see sort of. Things about okay, so let me read out right. some of the questions. One question from Yahya Burt. Why is there an absence of scholarship, not only Razia Sultana's rule, but what is also meant for a woman to lead the Delhi Sultanate? Uh, question from Hasibnu. What was the relationship of the Mughals with the greater Muslim world, other than rivalries? What were their relationship with the Ottomans in this period? Do you expound on this in the book? How do you view themselves in the great, greater Muslim world? Uh, and a final one, uh, Rizwan, I'll do three at a time and we'll get three responses. Why is there a, why isn't there a detailed history of Punjab written in recent times considering the regions of importance in South Asia? The last significant general history is by S.M. Latif over a century ago from the colonial period. What point did the Mughals become Indian? Bubble appears sparingly towards Indians in his autobiography. Hand it over to yourselves. Well, I, I'm sorry, I didn't really hear those questions. Can, can uh, Jack, can, did you hear those? Can you repeat them for me? I, I'm not. It, okay, I'll read the first one again. Um, first one from Yahya Bert, uh, leads in the UK, about Razia Sultana. So his question was, why is there an absence of scholarship, not only Razia Sultana's rule, but what is, but also what is meant for the, for the for a woman to lead the Delhi Sultanate, what is meant for a woman to lead the Delhi Sultanate? A question about relationships with the Mughals and the, the other parts of the Muslim world. Is besides rivalries, do you expand that in the group? And why isn't there a detailed history of the Punjab uh, since S. M. Latif's time? Yeah, there hasn't been really anything there. Well, I, I, the only question I was able to hear there was something about Razia Sultana. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what the question was, but I can only say that she stands out, obviously, as a, uh, as a, as a, as a important figure. In, in yes, I think the question about Razia Sultana was, wh what, 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 it, what did it mean for a woman to lead the Delhi Sultanate? Well, it's hard to say. We, we do know that she had to dress as a man. Uh, so if nothing else, it means that a woman could not be presented as a woman uh, in order to have credibility. But I do not think that that's the reason that she, she was ultimately brought down, uh, despite the fact that she was the favorite uh, child of, of her father, Il Tutmish. Uh, the real problem was that, that all of the... All of the children of El Tutmush were um, doomed by the fact that they were they were not only weak inherently, but more importantly, uh, the slave system was breaking down, and the loyalty of slaves, which had been a prominent feature in the 13th century, uh, by the time you get or the early 13th century, uh, by the time you get to the period of El Tutmush in the mid. 13th century, uh, the loyalty of slaves is not as dependable as it had been earlier. So I think that uh, Sultana, Razia Sultana, was a victim of that as much as she was uh, a victim of being a woman in a world in which women had not therefore ruled. One other question, uh, Professor Eaton, was about the 
you know, why is the Punjab, have, hasn't there been any recent histories of the Punjab considering the region's importance? Um, well, there have been important works on the Punjab in, in recent times. Um, there, there's a recent book, fairly recent book by, uh, by Indu Banga. Uh, there's, a, there's this book by, uh, several books by Purnamadhavan that we spoke about earlier, writing about the Sikhs. Um, uh, Fenich uh, is another study of, of the, the, the Sikhs of the Punjab that came out, his, his book on, I forget the title of that one. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't think the, I wouldn't say that there's been a, a, a deficit of, of research on the Punjab uh, relative to other parts of, of South Asia um, necessarily. Um, the, uh, One thing I thought was interesting, you, you, you make this point in your book, um, which is that the, the places where you have the largest concentrated conversion to Islam are the Punjab and Bengal, right. both of which had never been integrated into the kind of Hindu caste universe. Right. Right. Which I, that was a really interesting point. That's uh, correct. That's that's an important point. And I, that's one of the things that kind of drove me to, to the, the study of Bengal and Punjab both. I, I spent a year in Lahore and I spent a year and a half in, in uh, Dhaka uh, on both occasions trying to understand how do we how do we explain this phenomenon. And certainly one thing that these two regions did share in common was that neither one of them had been uh, tightly integrated into the, the Hindu caste system. Uh, especially Western Punjab. I'm speaking of the of the Jats, um, and uh, because they would ultimately form the the, the largest element of of uh, Punjabi Muslim society. Uh, the same is true in Bengal, uh, where you have uh, lots of communities living in the, especially the, the eastern part, known as Pati, uh, where that had not yet been had been integrated into the Hindu uh, caste system. Uh, to the degree that you find in, in North India, which happened to be the capital of these Muslim states. So there's a curious, uh, a curious contradiction between the, the center of Muslim power, which is North India, and the regions where Islam as a, as a faith became most vibrant from a demographic standpoint. And to explain that, I think one has to go deep into Indian history to understand the, the, the way in which Aryabharta, this homeland of, 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 of um, Brahmins, uh, was always geographically understood as, as occupying the, the Delhi Doab, the area between the Jumna and the, and the, and the Ganga. Uh, and then as you move east or west from that area, you are, it, it, the, the, the whole Hindu order is in a sense becoming diluted to the point where you go into East Bengal, uh, Brahmins would actually have to go through various elaborate ceremonies in order to become purified for having becoming polluted by even uh, visiting those regions. So that is part of the story. And that's, again, you're right. I think that's one of the things that are shared in common uh, between Western Punjab and, and Eastern Bengal. I just want to remind the listeners that Professor Eaton's been very generous and he's always saying, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. But all I'm doing is just reading things in his book. So in fact, he's right. Uh, <laughs> I'm not claiming any insights here, right? Uh, a couple of questions. Um, how do we understand pre-modern and early modern empires like the Mughals in comparison to empires and imperialism today or in the kind of colonial period? Uh, there's a push to... Uh, in some circles to see the Ottomans and the Mughals as similar to European colonizers, how would you respond to this? Right. Pre-modern empires are unlike anything today, I think, mainly because, um, well, many respects. In the first place, and we talked about this earlier, uh, the fact that the empires are really uh, multinational, multi, not national, multicultural, multi-religious systems where the emperor needs to be seen as 
uh, authentic and legitimate in the eyes of all these various diverse communities. This is true not just in India, but it's also true of the Ming Dynasty or the Qing Dynasty in China, uh, where the emperor had to present himself in, in part as a, as a Central Asian shaman, in part as a Buddhist bodhisattva, in part as a traditional Confucian emperor. Uh, and the same thing is true, uh, especially from Akbar's period forward, uh, where you have this doctrine of sacred kingship, uh, which blended together all sorts of different uh, ideas. I spoke earlier of the Jaroka Darshan, uh, which was a, an, an indigenously Indian institution. These kinds of things are, I think, characteristic of pre-modern empires, especially in India and China. Not so much the Ottoman. Uh, if you wanted to become an Ottoman noble, you had to be Muslim. You, you, if you, if you, a Christian had to be converted to Islam before he could enter the system, not just as a Janissary, uh, but in, at, at, at any level in the, in the Ottoman system. And that to me is a striking difference between India, uh, the Mughal Empire, and the, uh, and the Ottoman Empire, uh, where the Ottoman had, was much more uh, oriented around this whole idea of, of, of an Islamic state. After all, the Ottoman Sultan also was the Caliph. Those ideas never, uh, had any traction in India. A, a, second, a last point I would make, Jonathan, is in terms of difference between modern and pre-modern. Uh, in, in the modern era that we live in, you have this notion of the public sphere. Uh, Habermas's idea of, of the public space, right? Where everyone is trying to occupy that space, whether it's through, uh, and it's, of course, it's created by the media. So everyone is connected by not just newspapers and radio and television, but also obviously the internet and all this technology, so that there's a huge competition for controlling the public sphere. Um, that did not exist in the pre-modern world. And the lack of a public sphere in the 17th or 18th century or even earlier meant that different people could hold radically different ideologies or traditions and not be bothered because there was not any competition for who's controlling the media, who's controlling the public sphere. And that I think is a very important difference between the modern and the pre-modern anywhere in the world. That's very interesting. I I'm actually haven't heard that Jack, brought up before. We have a question directly from a person who put the hand up, Rizwan. Can I just get him through? Is that okay? Yeah. Rizwan. Yep. Just hold on. Rizwan, do you want to, I'm going to unmute now. Please um, ask your question directly. Um, yes. Um, yeah. The, the, um, I, the, the question about the general history of Punjab, uh, the book recommendations you made, I, I'm aware of um, those books. Uh, I was asking a general history uh, of the Punjab, but those books you recommended are limited in terms of either to a certain specific uh, period, a limited period of time in history, or on, on Sikh, uh, the, the Sikh um, people. Um, so uh, the, the, as far as I know, the last general uh, significant history, general history, was in the colonial period by um, S.M. Latif over a century ago. So I, I was asking whether you knew, uh, well, I was actually asking why there isn't a um, um, by Orient, Western Orientalists, uh, where, where have, has works, work been done on, on, on that? And, and um, considering the, the importance of this uh, area in, in, um, in, in, in South Asia. Uh, yes, I, would, I think you're, I agree with you. The, the books that I did cite and that I'm aware of are monographs. And monographs, almost by definition, take a narrow topic or a narrow theme or a narrow question and pursue that down to the, based on original sources. Whereas a general study of something like a whole region like the Punjab, um, uh, those kinds of studies, I, I could almost say have kind of gone out of fashion in a sense. Um, regional studies are not, um, you're, you're right, they are more characteristic of the colonial period, when the British conceived of India as a collection of, of regions. 
And I think what defines modern historiography is a turning away from general regional studies and a preference for uh, detailed monographs over particular questions. And so I think it's what you said about the Punjab is probably true if I think about it. It's not just the Punjab. I think you, it, it's almost anywhere in South Asia. Uh, you don't find the kinds of regional studies that try to tell you all there is to know about, say, Gujarat, uh, I mean, or, or, or Orissa, or Tamil Nadu, or whatever it might be. Uh, the, the, if you want to get a degree in history today, you do not write a provincial history. You, what you do is you write a monograph on a particular theme within a, 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 a province. So I think the answer to your question is, it's not so much that the Punjab has been ignored, it's that the whole tradition of provincial histories or regional histories uh, has kind of been sidetracked through the preferences and fashions of contemporary historiography. Um, there's a couple of questions about uh, um, why, why, did, why do you think Babur preferred Chagatai Turkic over Persian when he was writing his memoirs. And another question is about um, the kind of uh, general issue of just the female influence on Mughal rule as a broad question, but are there any, you know, you, you talk about a few important women like uh, Noura Jahan um, in your work. Right. Well, let me go to Babur first and the Chagatai thing. Uh, I mean, that's his native language. Uh, we know from the Babur Nama uh, and other things that were written by Babur, uh, I mean, he was a poet and he prided himself in Persian poetry uh, as well as Chagatai. Um, but to answer the question, why did he write the, his Babur Nama, his famous you know, autobiography, why did he choose Turkish? He, I think the major reason for writing that book was he wanted to write it for his son, Humayun, as a kind of a roadmap for how to rule this new kingdom uh, that I'm going to bequeath to you. And that's my personal view. Uh, obviously, Chagatai did not have the prestige or the trans-regional cachet as Persian did, uh, but he was not writing it for the Persian rule. He, he was writing it for his immediate family. And I, I think that's the reason that he chose Choctaw. Um, but as I said, at the same time, he was, he, he was a great connoisseur of Persian poetry um, and, a, and a judge, I might say. He was very harsh on people who would use the wrong poem at the wrong time, uh, <laughs> you know, in Persian. Uh, so there is that. This question of, of the role of women in Mughal society um, is a fascinating one. And I'm always frustrated by, the, by this kind of question because unfortunately, all we really know about uh, to a great extent are the elite women. I mean, I'm thinking of books by Ruby Lal uh, down at Emory University you know, in Atlanta, who has done work on Noor Jahan, who's done work on the, on the Mughal uh, uh, the harem the, the, and, the, and, the, and the women, uh, and also the work by um, Lisa Balalandilar uh, at Rice University in Texas, uh, who's also studied the, the, the role of, of women in, in the earlier period. Um, that is to say, the, 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 with, with Babur and Humayun, uh, not so much the, the period of Akbar and, 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 and John Gere. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 I, can, I can say this, that Noura Jahan, thinking about her alone, uh, she has under, undergone a, a, a huge transformation. I mean, decades ago, she was simply seen as a, a, a kind of a Bollywood um, star, in a sense. Uh, and it was not taken all that seriously in her own right. And uh, recent studies of her had really put her on the map as, as being a very important player in, in actually running the empire, especially as Jahangir himself kind of drank himself into the corner uh, in, the, in the latter years of his reign. Um, 
And, uh, and the other thing I would say is that when we speak of, of the authority of women in the, in the Mughal system, um, here is where especially the Rajputs had an extraordinary influence because it was the, it was Rajput women who became increasingly dominant in the harem. Uh, as I remarked earlier, they were the ones who bequeathed uh, the, the preference for Hindavi uh, as the language, the, the, the dialect of, of Braj, um, uh, spoken in, in uh, you know, in, in upper India. That, that became a court language through the agency of, of women in the court. So we see kind of in indirect ways how this influence became felt. I would, in a larger sense, I would suggest that the Indianization of the Mughal, of Mughal culture was largely a product of, uh, of, of the presence of women. Even though they may have been in the background, uh, they were the ones who raised the children and they were the ones who passed on this, this culture to the next generation. Uh, yeah, he, uh, we've got some questions, um, uh, Jack, a direct ones. Yahya Bert, who also asked directly, I'm going to unmute him, and then Fahad Ishtiak. We've got loads of questions, but we'll prioritize all the ones putting their hands up. Yahya, I'm going to unmute you and ask for you directly. Yeah. Oh, hello, sorry, um, I don't know if I can, you can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to ask Professor Eaton, thank you very much for the book, by the way, but how do you how do you see your work fitting in with the thesis by the late Shihab Ahmed of the be, be, um, Beng, Balkans to Bengal complex? Do you see the Persian, Persianate cosmopolis as it truly extending uh, to that extent, a centre perhaps on in India, in Persia? Yes, yes. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, Shihab Abham's book, you're referring to what is Islam, right? Yeah, yeah. I found that to be a very frustrating book because I never found an answer to his, the question that's posed in the title. Um, but I found it even more frustrating in the sense that he, I think he, he, yes, he does talk about this Bengal to Balkans complex. Uh, but he fails to see, I think, uh, Persian culture as, as detached from the Islamic tradition, or as detached as I think it really was. Um, and that's really one of the things that was influenced me when I, when I was writing my book. I, I'd already, I read his book, and uh, I thought there needed to be a response to that. And, and so in, in a sense, I wanted to think about this idea of Balkans to Bengal, but make it much more present, give it a, a greater prominence uh, in, the, in the larger story, and to, and to see it uh, as, in a sense, uh, displacing religion altogether, whereas Shahab Ahmed does not do that. Uh, whatever he means by Islam, and I remain um, uh, uncertain as to what he really answers that question, uh, it does not seem to give, in my view anyway, a very prominent place for, for the Persian tradition. And that's what I tried to do. That. In, in my book was, in a sense, an, an attempt to supply that, uh, that, that, to fill that gap. Okay. Okay. Is that okay, Yahya? That's great, yeah, thank you. Yeah, we've got another question now from Fahad Ishtiak. I'm just going to unmute him. Thanks. Hi, good evening, Mr. Richard. I just have a question. Yes. Yes, uh, you can hear me, right, properly? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, great. Uh, how much of the uh, uh, Persianization or Persification of the Indian, of the South Indian, uh, you know, subcontinent, can we put down to the rise of the Safavid Empire in Iran? Um, so a lot of scholars leaving the land, maybe escaping persecution, finding new opportunities. How much can we put it down to the rise of the Safavid Empire. Um, did it accelerate due to that or due to the exchange of people, exchange of ideas happening on a more frequent basis? Can we, uh, is there a thought that you have on that? Yes, um, thank you for the question. You are absolutely right. There was a, um, there was a, I wouldn't say an exodus, a mass exodus, 
this, but there certainly was a lot of um, uh, movement of Iranian poets and Sufis and various kinds of literati from Safavid Iran to the Mughal Empire after the rise of, of Shah Ismail and the imposition of Shiism in, in Iran. Um, and we can see that happening in North India. I did not talk about that in, in my own book, perhaps as I should have, given the title of the book. And I think if I were to do another edition, I would probably talk more about those migrants. Um, but they were certainly there. On the other hand, I don't think they were all that significant because the, 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 the overall arc of Persianization in India had already been underway long before 1500, long before Shah Ismail rises to power in Tabriz. You know, the, 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 uh, the Mongol invasion itself had, had driven all these Central Asians out of, out, of these, out of these Turks, these Persianized Turks out of Central Asia into India uh, beginning in the early 1200s. Right. And we see all this evidence of, of Persian culture uh, infiltrating India long before uh, Ismail comes on. So all I, what I would say is that what the Safavid revolution meant was that there was a, there was a, a further bump, there was a further uh, influx of Iranians, which certainly had important uh, impact on, in, in North India anyway, not the Deccan, uh, but in North India. Well, the Deccan too, I guess, and I think about it, there was, there was certainly more Iranians coming there as well. But they were only building on a tradition which was already very well established. I mean, I think one point to, to keep in mind is, you know, if you read things like the Nuzhat and another of Abu Hayy al-Hassani kind of biographical dictionary of India throughout the ages, yeah. but you, you see a huge number. There's, yeah, there's lots that come from Iran and Central Asia. But there's a huge yeah. number of scholars, ulama, coming from Hadramut into Gujarat. Right. And even going right. and, you know, so... One of the things that Professor Eaton brings up, I think really brings up in his book several times is you get these sort of like almost gangs, like on one side of the royal court is the Easterners, namely the kind of indigenous Muslims from India. And right. then there's the Westerners who are this sort sort of gaggle of Tur Afghans and Iranians and Turks. And, um, you know, it, it depends on sort of what language they really feel comfortable speaking. So I think that was something that you see. And this appears, I think, if I recall correctly from your book, it, even in the 1300s and 1400s. That's right. That's right. Uh, in places like the Daulatabad. And the Daulatabad, that's right. The, 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 and, it, and it became a poisonous feud between these two factions of Muslims. Those who were, as you say, born in the Deccan, descended ultimately from migrants from North India and the in the in the mid uh, early 1300s, and those who were imported uh, by sea from uh, from Iran, from Arabia, uh, especially under Firuz Bahmani uh, in the early 15th century, uh, you get whole shiploads of nobles who he's he's inviting to come to the Deccan, and who receive all kinds of patronage and, and, and appointments to uh, you know in the nobility. In, uh, in the South. And a lot of these same people end up in Vijanagara, uh, which is a very important point because we are, you know, previous historiography made us believe that there was some kind of a marginal line between a Hindu South and a Muslim North. Whereas in fact, uh, many of these immigrants, these Westerners, uh, Muslims immigrating from Iran, Central Asia, Arabia, ended up uh, in the armed forces of Vijanagara. Um, and that's a very important dynamic. So yes, uh, th that cleavage between the, between the native born Deccanese and the, the, the foreign arrivals uh, really tore the, the, the kingdom apart, the Bahmani state fell apart because of that. And that same cleavage was then inherited by all of the successor states of the Bahmanis from roughly 1500 forward. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm choosing questions because uh, I think Mizan's battery died or something. Um, the uh, let's see. Um, there's a couple of questions about Hagia Sophia issue. I don't know if you want to get into that. Hagia Sophia and 
how can you solve modern Indian sectarianism? Do you have any, <laughs> I mean, you, you mentioned how your book is attempting to, to deal with that, but I, I don't think we expect you to resolve this. No, I'm not going to solve the Hagia Sophia issue this morning. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one thing, a question about the relationship of the Mughals and the Ottomans. I mean, I know there there was some exchange uh, between them uh, over the over the centuries. But one thing I thought was really interesting in your book is you talk about how uh, basically after Akbar, um, the the Mughal princes, uh, you have a unification, you, you, you go away from what John Woods would call the panage state model, where the kind of collective sovereignty of the Turco, Turco-Mongol Persian system, where kind of everybody in the family has a, has a potential share. And no, it, now the, 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 the succession is just going to go to one prince. Right. But, you know, the, the father sends these princes out as governors, they campaign, they build up their networks, they build up their, 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 little, their little armies. And then the second the father dies, it's, you know, ya tacht, ya tachta, as you say, either right. off or the grave. So right. you, you, you mentioned how in, in the precise the time in the Ottoman Empire in the 1600s, where you have this sort of notion of the sultanate of women or the, the harem sultan, where the, the, the Ottoman sovereigns themselves are basically just shut up and not allowed to do anything. That's right. the, uh, the Mughals developed this system that is sort of like a, you know, social, Darwinian, Darwinian weaning. Uh, right. That has these these kind of brutal wars of succession, but then whoever wins is usually uh, very very competent. Um, and so that I thought was interesting is a kind of compare you know, to think about a comparison between these two states. Yes, uh, yeah. This says I actually I, I, let me just say one thing here about the book in general of, of, of what it, in terms of its source material. Nothing in my book is new knowledge. This is not a monograph. Basically, when you write a book like this, you are you are plundering from the, whatever existing knowledge has, has come up. And on this point that you're raising here about the the nature of uh, wars of succession and and what they were really all about, uh, this idea I got almost entirely from uh, Munis Farouki's book his study of the princes of the Mughal Empire, where he goes and elaborates in great detail uh, this very transition that you speak of, namely this earlier idea of collective sovereignty, which had been part of the, 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 the Mongol, uh, Turkic, Central Asian tradition, and that kind of bleeding into a, a, a winner-take-all understanding of, of the empire which does indeed have a certain Darwinian flavor to it in as much as it, it, it guarantees that although the wars might be bloody, uh, they might be uh, disruptive in the short term. In the long term, you're gonna end up with the more, uh, the more connected, the, more, the best networked uh, prince of them all. And that certainly is true with the, the big one, of course, the War of Succession of 18, of, of 1657-58, when Aurangzeb comes to power as, Alam, as the Emperor Alamgir. Now that takes me to, you know, my decision to make a whole separate chapter of focusing on just that one man. Uh, Aurangzeb is arguably one of the most controversial figures in all of Indian history, in my view. Uh, many historians of the Mughal Empire uh, don't even want to talk about him because it's such, such a toxic kind of lightning rod. Uh, radioactive <laughs> would be another word. Uh, a third rail, perhaps. Mixing metaphors wildly here. But my point is that, that I felt I needed to talk about Aurangzeb and devote a whole chapter to him because that's almost 50 years <clears throat> of Indian history where India was completely transformed uh, in at least in many respects it was transformed uh, with this one individual kind of towering over the whole thing so um, and I also did that because I wanted to use biography I, I'm fascinated by biography as a as a rhetorical technique uh, I wrote a book on the Deccan called the social history of the Deccan eight Indian lives, 
where each chapter was structured around one figure. And uh, I, I kind of borrowed that same idea when I came back to this book. Uh, obviously, when you're talking about a thousand years, when you're talking about all of India, uh, it's impossible to have a collection of biographies. But I did do that just for one chapter because I felt that the, this, the, the, the reign of Aurangzeb, Alangir, was so important and so misunderstood. And so many themes are come uh, to the fore uh, that I had to do that, including this theme of succession. Uh, the idea of, uh, because he, the, during his reign, that you see the full uh, transition from this earlier notion of collective sovereignty to the winner take all, one, uh, one sovereign gets the whole prize. Um, and and that's, that's, why I, that's why I wrote that chapter the way I did. I wanted to kind of feature the, those kinds of ideas as, as being matured and coming to their own right, light uh, in the reign of, of Alamgir. Um, there's one question left we have time for, but uh, before I ask this one, said that, but I think it's interesting about that is you also show how, in a way, Aurangzeb kind of brings that system down because he's so, not only do you have the threat, you know, there's always a threat of the one of the princes sort of coming back too early and kicking his dad out or, you know, his dad's not quite dead, right? Like with right. Shah Jahan. So right. one of you, you talk about why did Aurangzeb sort of obsessively campaign in the Deccan? He never leaves his army as right. that he never wanted any of his sons to get control of the army like he had. And so none of them ever really become, can be the next Aurangzeb because he's such a towering figure that he doesn't really allow them to. Precisely. Yeah, he, he did not allow them to have the, the, the freedom of movement, the maneuverability uh, that he himself had, had been given because he was very self-conscious of, of what might happen to him should, should they have that kind of freedom. This all, I came upon this idea when I happened to find a direct quote from an Italian traveler, I think his name is uh, Giovanni Carreri, who happened to interview Alamgir while he was in the deck, and I end the chapter seven with this. He, he asked straightforward, I mean, this is a, for an historian, this is almost too good to be true. And it's amazing that no historians have picked up on this quote. Kareri asks Aurangzeb around 1678 or something like that, early 80s, why have you been marching up and down the Deccan all this time, constantly at war, while the capital is up in Delhi? You're down here, you know, waging war in this apparently fruitless war against these Marathas. And Aurangzeb gave a very straightforward answer. He said, look, if my father uh, had been more attentive and more watchful of his sons, he would not have been, he would not have suffered the fate he did, which of course is the fate that, uh, that Aurangzeb himself gave him. And so that, that theme to me was that, that was one of the answer, one of the ways in which I wanted to answer the question of how we solve a riddle of why did Aurangzeb spend the last 25 years of his life marching up and down the, 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 the Deccan Plateau, uh, subduing one fort after another, only to see the first fort come back like whack-a-mole, nothing was kept down. Um, and that, that quote by Carreri, I think, captured the central dilemma of the empire, which is that Aurangzeb had had taken this idea way too far um, of, of, of winner take all to such an extent that one must not allow other potential um, princes the the same kind of maneuverability that they might become the the uh, the next emperor and overthrow the previous emperor. So that um, that, that yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um... Again, I really recommend this book, people. Uh, last question from Zanira. Uh, can, you, uh, can you give a quick summary of the genealogy of Hindi slash Urdu, or could you provide book recommendations on this? Yes. Um, the book recommendation, well, let's see. I don't have, I don't have her book here, but the, the, the book you want 
is by Francesca Orsini. This is one of the books. This is co-authored with uh, Samira Sheikh called After Timur Left. But Francesca Orsini uh, uh, at SOAS in London, she is the one who I think has done the most exciting work on tracing the genealogy of modern Hindi Urdu. Um, and the big point that she makes that I think is so important is that in the pre-modern period, especially the 15th century that she specializes on, language was not politicized. There was no notion that, that Hindus wrote in Hindi and Muslims wrote in Urdu. Of course, those words didn't even exist in the 15th century. Uh, there was one word, Hindavi, uh, which was used for any local language. It could be Marathi, it could be Bengali, it could be Gujarati, uh, uh, or it could be Braj, whatever. And her point is that, that, that languages were not identified with communal identity. And um, so I would recommend Orsini, Francesca Orsini, as the go-to person uh, for thinking through the, the, the genealogy of, of modern day Hindi Urdu uh, in, in the previous. There are many other books one could talk about. Uh, I think Walter Hakala uh, has, has another book that's very interesting. Um, his study is somewhere up here. I can't see it right now. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, Orsini and Hakala are the two books that immediately come to mind in, in, in trying to think about the, the pre-modern genealogy of Hindi Urdu. Okay. Um, sorry, I was writing that down myself uh, as you were talking. Um, I don't know if Mizan's here anymore because his battery died. So I might did have we, to do we, that. Did we lose him? <laughs> unless he unless he interrupts me. Oh wait, I see some. Unless he interrupts me and tells me to be quiet, I'll I'll do the MC duties of. I'm back, the Jack. Session. I'm back. Okay, I'm back. you're back. Ah, so he's you, back. You he's back. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, continue. We've still got about five minutes. If you want to continue. Um. Not round up, maybe perhaps. Okay, um, we're, we're flex. We're flexible. It's up to you. We've got see. loads of questions coming. Through. It's really up to the professor and yourself. I mean, I, I'm 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 always happy to talk, but I also don't don't want Professor Eaton to like pass out from exhaustion. No, 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 no. I'm delighted. I've got all the time. This is early morning. I have all day. So uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, so continue, guys. We've got about uh, yeah. I'm just trying to find questions that are um, 15, to 15, 15 yeah. minutes maximum. Some to find some questions that are you know you've touched on some, so I don't want to get any questions that you kind of sort of touched on already. Um, one thing that was really interesting, I thought, was how um, you know to, to get back to this issue of like kind of pre-modern states, uh, the and, and Marshall Hodgson talks about about this. You may have mixed feelings about that, but this idea that the, you know pre-modern conquest states are sort of driven by this logic where, in order to pay your troops with precious metals, you have to conquer more area and get more treasure, right. um, and then you can't really you, you stop conquering. Uh, you kind of reach some limit, and then you have to pay your troops. So you create this sort of ikhta or jagir system, right? Where you say, okay, well, you get all the revenue from this place. And then right. eventually the ruler ends up giving away kind of title so much land that right. the the nobles no longer need the ruler. The ruler sort of becomes a just a, uh, a titular figure. Uh, and is that is that sort of what happens with starts to happen in the, the reign of Aurangzeb and or is that or is that a, is this a more specific Indian context? I, that's a great question and I think it is it's not confined to the period of Aurangzeb at all. Uh, we see this this thing happening long before. I mean Hodgson talks about the, the military patronage state which is what I think you had in mind right uh, in, in your own introduction there the pre-modern state. Um, but I, th I think there's a deeper issue, and I talk about this at the be beginning of the book, in, the, in chapter one, uh, when I speak about the, the Cholas uh, and the Chalukyas uh, of South India, 
where you have a similar dynamic whereby the, the, the ruler, the Raja, the Maharaja, would give away so many symbols of power to his subordinates that the subordinates ultimately ended up uh, de facto independent. Uh, and this was the paradox, it seems to me, of Indian kingship long before the Turks and Persians even arrived, which is to say uh, that in order to prove that you were really a Maharaja and not simply a Raja, uh, you had to bestow upon your subordinates uh, the, the fly whisk, uh, the kettle drum, uh, or other symbols of, of authority. And pretty soon these symbols became more than symbolic uh, they would also represent things like the, the right to collect taxes or even the right to, to raise armies. Well, when you are collecting taxes and raising armies, you are, for all intents and purposes, independent. And this is how large empires in, in, in ancient India and, and early, early medieval India, uh, they would fall apart precisely over this mechanism. The Chalukyas of the Deccan, for example, uh, gave way to the Hoysalas in the north, uh, in the, rather the Hoysalas in the south, the Yadavas in the north, uh, the Kakatiyas in the east, precisely because they, they, they were, in a sense, driven by the need to, to give away these symbols of, of authority. And so this is not new with Marshall Hodgson, uh, the military patronage state. There's a paradox uh, that is found in, in rulership in India which predates the coming of, of the Turks, but it's also practiced by the Turks. The, 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 the Mughal Empire itself ended up uh, having to partner with all kinds of uh, local figures around the fringes of its own imperial uh, edges. I mean, you, when you have local Sufis in, 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 in the Punjab, uh, or, you, or you have uh, landowners in Gujarat, uh, or you have uh, zamindars in Bengal who are given de facto authority precisely because there's no one else out there. But these people already do have authority in their local communities. So you simply confer upon them a certain measure of sovereignty. So that the idea here is that bit by bit, Mughal sovereignty was chipped away and given to all these minor figures in the, in the process of, its, of imperial expansion. And there's an irony in the sense that the, the empire ultimately found itself being hollowed out from the, from the center by the very fact that it, it, was, it, was, it was necessary to bestow these, these, these uh, uh, de facto rights of, of governance on, on lesser figures. But my point is that this already had a deeper parallel in India long before the, the Turks even arrived. It goes all the way back to, to the, the Cholas and the Cholukas. Um, one question about uh, ulama and um, traditions of learning. Uh, one thing you mentioned in the book is you, you, you know, I, I, I don't know if I didn't read enough about it, but you talk about Akbar's medrasa reforms. Yeah. Uh, and I was wondering, I don't, I think you just, you mentioned it sort of in passing. Is there more you can add or, or would like to add about that? Or is it something we should go and read on or? Okay, which, which reforms do you have in mind by Akbar? Because uh, he made lots of reforms. Remember. Yeah, uh, it, I can't remember. It's, uh, I think it's toward the very end of the book. It's not, um, you mentioned it sort of in, ret in, in passing and we're kind of referring back to Akbar and his, um, well, for example, the madrasa system was reformed by Akbar as a vehicle for the diffusion of Persian language. Um, and Persian becomes the language of state from 1572 or whatever the exact year was, that all levels of the empire uh, would be administered through this one language, Persian. And to do that, he needed to reform the madrasa system to be not a exclusively religious uh, institution, but rather one that also imparted language. You know, I just found something that I that, thank first. Thank you for uh, uh, answering that. But um, this, I really want to know the answer to. 
uh, it, this is uh, the, the end of the book. You close with a set of, of of observations, which I think are really fascinating. Um, which is you you basically say that we really shouldn't think about modernity sort of starting with the British, but that a lot of the processes that lead to modernity in South Asia are really present going back into the 1500s. You talk about systematization, routinization. Um, you talk about uh, Aurangzeb and notion of rule of law. Right. And one of the things I thought was really interesting, especially, and it's really ironic in the light of when you look at Indian travelers in the late 1700s and 1800s, people like uh, Munshi Timad and people like who traveled to England or yeah. Mirza Abu Talib, and they talk about how, you know, the British are so punctual and the Europeans are so punctual as opposed to sort of the decadent, lazy, sloth, their decadent, lazy, sloth-like Indian, fellow Indians are sitting around eating food and writing Persian poetry. But you bring up this point about how Akbar has this clock, this water clock in the Fatsabur Sikri Palace, and right. everything in the palace runs by the clock, which I thought was really interesting. Right. Yeah, that was an observation made by a, a Jesuit uh, who, who was there. And uh, I picked up on that. I, I, I forget which, who that was, but it was it, one of the Jesuits at Akbar's court made this observation, kind of offhand observation. And I, I said, wow, that's, that's an interesting point. Uh, and I, the, the, the whole, it's like an office. The whole court runs by time. And we think of you know, the invention of the, of the mechanical clock in Europe uh, as having this revolutionary character of that, that people who had been farmers, who simply lived by the rising and the setting of the sun, are now under the rule of this device, which tells them when they have to show up for work and when they leave work. And, and we always think of this as kind of a, a, something that's as uniquely modern and uniquely European. And then I, but I, I saw this offhand remark uh, made by this Jesuit. I found that that's very interesting because clearly Akbar was already anticipating a similar kind of idea uh, with respect to the running of the court at Fatakur Sikri. Um, so yes, that, that is one dimension of what I think we can call, legitimately call modernity. And the, and the, uh, the rule of law the idea that there's a, that, that law exists outside of religion, outside of society, uh, and, it, and it dissolves the idea of sacred rulership. That idea was introduced by Alamgir, I thought was very important because it gave this kind of ironic twist that we are normally accustomed to thinking of Akbar and Aurangzeb uh, as, as polarized between you know, the good Akbar and, and the wicked Aurangzeb. This is the trope that we always hear. Whereas, in fact, I came to the conclusion that they are both equally interesting because they are both equally modern, but they both also failed uh, in, for, for different reasons, of course. But, so I chose to, to, to end by thinking of Akbar and Aurangzeb, but not through the usual trope of uh, good versus bad, you know, but rather uh, tragic heroes or tragic modernists who had these idea in their head, but they were not able to fully institutionalize it. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for taking your time and, and sharing your knowledge with us, discussing your book with us. Uh, thank thank you. you all for coming. Mizan, thank you for organizing this. You thank do you. a lot of thank leg you, work. Dr. Jonathan, thank you, Professor Richard Eaton. Jonathan, do you want to have final words and final words from uh, Professor Richard Eaton, then you can close off. Uh, I would just say I really hope that I get to um, have some good daisy food with both of you and how many or any other people <laughs> in the audience are going to be there at some point soon and that we can all eventually start moving around. That's my yeah, that's I want I to repeat that. I, I'd like to second that motion, uh, Mizan. I want to thank you for making this possible. And I also want to say how much I look forward to coming back to London. I hope so, Professor. I'm so sorry to everyone and I'm so sorry for the noise. Uh, around me, um, number one. Number two, there's a lot of questions still coming through and people are really annoyed. I um, apologize, I really like to apologize. But anyway, I'd like to thank you once again, uh, everyone for attending. It's been one of our longest sessions, most fruitful sessions as well. Hope to see you in the next session as well. Thank you.
Professor, we hope to see you after the whole lockdown. Thank you very much. And Dr. Jonathan as well. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We'll do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thanks, Jack.